Hello, everyone. My name is Nina Streeter, and I'm a lecturer in the Finance Department of Boston University's Questrom School of Business. I'm also Director of Asset Management and Private Capital Investment Analyst at Wells Fargo's Private Wealth Management Business, where I cover the private capital fund space. So it is my great pleasure today to moderate uh, the discussion, The Rise of SPAC, Fed or Future, featuring a Claudia Saraf, Jane Goldstein, and Mikhail Gurevich. Before I introduce the featured speakers, I'd like to thank you, the Boston University community, for your interest in SPACs. You're a global audience of alumni, faculty, staff, and students from more than 15 countries and 34 US states, and we appreciate you making time to attend. Many of you are donors to Boston University, and I'd like to extend a special thanks to you for making programming like this possible. Next, I have a few housekeeping issues to address. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing in the BU Alumni Association website. You'll be sent a link in a follow-up correspondence. Second, our panelists are looking forward to answering your question at the end of the program. But if you have questions along the way, feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. Hover your mouse over the Zoom toolbar and select Q&A. So let me introduce today's featured speakers. We are extremely fortunate to have with us three distinguished alumni who are involved with SPACs from three different perspectives. Aklavia Saraf earned a business administration and management degree from Questrom and is NASDAQ's global head of SPAC listing and a managing director of new listings. In his role, he advises companies on the process and benefits of listing on NASDAQ, works with early stage company to leverage NASDAQ's resources and helps develop NASDAQ's relationship with investors, law firms, and other capital markets constituents. He sees interest in SPACs from the bird's eye view because many of them are listed on the NASDAQ. Jane Goldstein received two degrees from BU. She graduated from the College of Arts and Sciences with a degree in French and followed up with a law degree. She's a partner at Ropes and Gray and co-head of the firm's merger and acquisition group for North America and co-managing partner of the Boston office. Jane is also head of the retail and consumer brands industry group. Jane sees companies that are being approached by SPACs that want to buy them and has advised sponsors who are raising SPACs, thus as a superlative behind the scenes view of those transactions. Mikhail Gurevich also holds two degrees from BU, an MBA and a BS in electrical engineering, and has been awarded distinguished young alumni awards from both the college and the university. Mikhail is the founder and managing partner of Dominion Capital, an investment firm he established specializing in structured finance. He's also a serial entrepreneur, having previously started a fintech research company and also co-founded a security and analytics company. He is a longtime SPAC investor. So I know we have a wide range of attendees with us today, some of whom may know a lot about the SPACs and some who may know a lot less. So I will work to keep this as jargon free as possible and let me lead off of the basics, which I'm gonna boil down to a three-step process, and then we can get to the meat of the topic. So what's a SPAC? SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company, and it's a vehicle in which to take companies public. These used to be called blank check companies because no underlying company had yet been identified. They've been around for decades, but only in the last few years have they become so popular. And one of the first big name companies to go public via SPAC was Boston-based DraftKings. Step one. A sponsor typically uh, private equity or hedge fund firms, so well-known investors, put up seed capital and raise money in an IPO, usually at $10 a share, and that money will subsequently be used to buy the private company. After the IPO, there's nothing there but the publicly traded shell that owns a trust fund into which the proceeds raised in the IPO are deposited. They're essentially held in treasury, so very safe. It's protected cash. And at this stage, the investor has a hard time losing money. Within two years, the sponsor needs to find a private company that agrees to be purchased. We're going to call this the target company. And if it doesn't buy a company, the sponsor loses all its seed capital. Step two, the SPAC sponsor finds a private company that agrees to be acquired. Remember that when companies go public, usually only a portion of their shares are sold initially. If the portion of the target company being bought is more than the amount the SPAC has raised, the new money needs to be raised privately via a pipe. This is how many SPAC targets are valued in the billions, but the original SPAC raised only a fraction of that money. A pipe is a private investment in public equity, and big investors here are BlackRock, Fidelity, just to name a few. 
So here's a quick math example. A SPAC raises 100 million. They negotiate to buy 10% of a company worth a billion, which is 100 million. They don't need any pipe money. But if they're buying 20% of that company, 200 million, they need to raise another 100 million via a pipe. The SPAC sponsor, pipe investor, and private targeting target company are the ones jointly agreeing to a price for that target company. And this is an important distinction from an IPO. We're gonna hear more about this later. Step three, the sponsor announces which company it will be buying and at what valuation, describes it to the shareholders who vote first on whether to go ahead and buy the company, and second, whether they want to continue as shareholders in the new deal or just get their cash back. The pre-announcement value of a SPAC can move up and down, but it's really just worth 10 bucks a share. After the announcement, the price can become more volatile, but it's still just backed by the $10 a share since they haven't yet bought the company. Once the purchase closes, the private target company has then been merged with a public company, thereby filling the SPAC shell, which is then usually renamed for the target company. And now the company trades like any other public company. It's no longer tied to $10 a share. And the portion that is publicly traded is owned by any SPAC investors who haven't yet sold and other buyers of public stocks. And the SPAC is then gone. This whole last portion of the process is called de -spacking. So there are three main players, the sponsors, the investors, and the target company, and three steps. Form a SPAC and raise the money in the IPO, find a company, raise pipe money if needed, and price the deal. And the third step, announce the deal, get shareholder approval, close the deal, wind up the SPAC. Voila, another company has gone public via a SPAC. So this is the very fast, short Spark Notes or Cliff Notes version of what SPACs are, but we haven't discussed the why of this or any of the underlying issues. So now let's get into the interesting part of the discussion. So IPO versus SPAC. Do initial, um, Claudia, in your role as an MD for new listings at NASDAQ, can you help us understand why a company would prefer to go public via a SPAC versus a traditional IPO? Absolutely. Um, and thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be back, I guess, on campus virtually um, and, and looking forward to certainly being back in person. Um, so certainly an exciting time in the capital markets, just given the low interest rate environment. You know, the equity market has been a hotspot for investors throughout the, the year. Uh, last year was certainly a banner year. And a lot of people were putting their money into SPACs. Um, as interest rates start to increase over the next year, we might see some pullback in the SPAC market. But a couple of things that you're going to see that are pretty important is, you know, companies are now triple track to go public, IPO, M&A, SPACs. And with the IPO, there's the direct listing for some, the traditional market, and certainly the SPAC market. Uh, and while the SPAC market's not a replacement for the traditional IPO, it's just another option um, that companies can look to and as they evaluate the advantages uh, that we have heard about in the SPAC market certainly are, are coupled. It's the money, to your point, is sitting in a trust account. You know what's in there. You know how much it's worth. You also have some great comps on the, uh, on the pipe deals. So in a way, I think of it as almost like a glass um, kind of um, floor as the valuation. In a traditional IPO, you truly don't know how much you're getting from the IPO process until the night of pricing, which was when you know how many millions of shares you've sold at what price point. With the SPAC, as you near the completion of the negotiation and an LOI sign, you know exactly what's in the trust. You have a good indication of what will happen out of the pipe deal that comes. And you have a better idea on valuation as a target company. So I think that's that's one clear advantage. The quality of the type of investors that are involved in um, not only on the SPAC sponsor side, but on the pipe side, these are some of the quality investors, long-term investors that we've seen in the capital market. Uh, they are constituents that have had a track record. And that's another advantage that we have certainly noticed over the last few years that the SPAC target company um, will experience. So those are, I think, two that stand out to me. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Jane, in your role working with companies, can you add some more points here? Yeah, I, I again, it's nice to be back on campus and thanks for having me. And Eclavia is exactly right. Um, the biggest benefit to target companies in a DSPAC transaction is certainty. Certainty of valuation, certainty of close, certainty that um, 
the people that are investing in you have already um, shown that they believe in your concept. Um, as a you know, in the in the IPO market, you, you go out there, you might have lumpy earnings. People don't really understand what you're trying to do. Um, if you're in a high growth mode, a lot of it's on the come. And so by having the DSPAC LOI or letter of intent, you, you get the certainty. Um, what you worry about on the target side is whether that SPAC can actually get the pipe funding they need. Um, and, and that is sort of the, the negative side when you're looking for which SPAC do you want to transact with, you want to make sure it's a spec that either already has pipe investors lined up or the sponsors have committed to forward purchases so that you know the cash will be there. Because as you mentioned earlier, Nina, a SPAC target has to be at least 80% of the trust account. And most of these deals are way in excess of the trust account. So they need additional financing. So Let's stick with So what else should the companies be looking for? They've got certainty, they've got some financing lined up. Um, as they're looking for these different sponsors, are there any other um, issues that they ought to be more or less aware of? I think the quality of the SPAC sponsor, as Claudia mentioned, there are some SPAC sponsors out there that are well known um, deal makers know how to make deals, looking at the quality of the members of the board and their deal experience and their operational experience, frankly. And another thing that's very attractive are that some of these companies aren't really ready for prime time. They, they wouldn't be able to do their own IPO either because they don't have senior management that understands how to talk to the market or they need help um, with strategic partnerships and the like. And so I think you really wanna look for a sponsor that can bring some of those you know, non-economic but still very, very important attributes to the table. Interesting. Um, so Mikhail, can you once walk us through some of the sponsor economics? Um, and can you also touch on warrants and how they work because this can get a little involved. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for having me on to um, second the other guys. Um, pleasure to be back virtually. Um, so in a nutshell, basically the way it works is uh, the sponsor, like you said, they put up the uh, risk capital. Um, so if you look at the, you know, in terms of pricing, LP investors uh, usually come in at around $10. That's a typical price, $10 a share. And um, it costs anywhere between three to eight dollars on average, depending on the size of the SPAC um, for the sponsorship per portion. That's the risk capital. And um, in terms of the cost basis, that translates to anywhere between a dollar a share for the cheapest ones to, you know, I've seen as high as seven dollars, eight dollars maybe. Um, but on average, they're about, uh, you know, called five, it's like four to five dollars a share. That's um, the sponsor's cost basis typically in a lot of these SPACs. So, uh, you know, it's like a classic risk reward, right? Um, I think basically you have uh, higher risk, right? Because if you don't get the SPAC done, you're going to lose all your money, but your cost basis is lower. In addition to that, like you said, there is usually a warrant package attached, but, um, you know, the LP investors also partake in the warrant because when, um, you know, when they get, when the SPAC is, is done, right? Um, it usually comes as a unit, uh, unit priced um, at $10 and units come with a combination of uh, common shares, uh, warrants and rights. Um, so that, you know, that was popular last year. Although I've seen the rights, um, I've seen warrants kind of start going away as the market heated up on the SPACs, but now they're coming back because um, the reels are coming up. So, you know, there's a number of ways to kind of price these things, but typically, you know, again, you get, you have a unit that's comprised of those three things. Um, you know, specifically for the sponsor, it's, um, you know, they usually get sponsor shares um, and sponsor warrants. And the way they're different from the kind of the, uh, what the, co the regular investors get is that the sponsor warrants that don't trade publicly in the market and they have a little bit more restrictions um, attached to them. But that's where you get quite a lot of upside if you get the SPAC done. And it also aligns the SPAC sponsor with 
um, you know, with the company and everyone else, because obviously if this doesn't work out, then, uh, you know, the warrants are, are you know, they're not going to be worth anything. But the, yes. And then if, um, how long does the uh, sponsor have before they find a company in which they're going to buy? And what happens to their investment, the sponsor's investment, if they can't close a deal? And what happens to the um, investors, the, the people who bought in at the IPO, if the sponsor doesn't close a deal? So for, so for the investors, it's really easy, right? If, uh, if the SPAC doesn't happen, they get their money back out of the trust. Uh, for the sponsor, it's a little bit different where, um, you know, there's actually two times, usually sometimes it's a little different, but for the most part, um, there are two times when okay, money gets injected into the, the actual shell in, at inception and it's called the founders round and it's the lowest cost basis, usually, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars just to kick off the, um, you know, all the vendors working on, you know, preparing everything. And then a um, couple months down the line, um, you know, a bigger sum, uh, that's where the bulk of the money go from the sponsor that goes in. And then the sponsor has anywhere between, you know, let's say up to two years to find the um, company to buy. Although, you know, you don't want to wait until the very end because the, the actual merger process also takes time. Uh, but, um, you know, I've seen extension being, being granted and these things can go on for a lot longer than two years. Uh, you know, maybe I've seen almost as long as four years in some cases, but, but on average, it's, it's about, I would say by, by, and the thing is, it's like uh, almost like an exponential decay function where if uh, you, you don't get it done and then like, let's say in the first 10 months, it's, it's much, much difficult, much more difficult to get it done afterwards because it indicates some kind of issues either with the sponsor team or um, otherwise. Right. And I would imagine there's also a certain amount of, um, as sponsors get close to the end of that point, the, the quality company they're looking for, their lens might degrade a little as they're looking at losing their seed money. If not yeah, but I mean, sometimes, you know, what happens is you, you know, you start talking to a company that you like and uh, you start doing the diligence and you end up discovering something that you didn't know before. So then you have to break that off and then go find. So it does happen, right? For, for a number of reasons, not to say that mm -hmm. um, no, if it does happen, it's, it's like bad on the sponsor, but. Yeah, Anything from the SPAC, ooh, sorry. No, no, come in. I was just going to say from the SPAC sponsor side, just sort of a legal issue for the SPAC sponsor is as they get to the end of the period and it's there's been one major litigation um, against the SPAC and the allegation was that because they were at the end of the period, they were overpaying for an asset in order to get their deal done. So besides the sort of practical issue of wanting to get your deal done quickly, there's also, you know, litigation exposure that is created. So you want to get your deals done as quickly as possible. And the research has shown, I was looking on um, spacreport.com where you can find more information on this and the, the timing to get deals done has shrunk um, in many cases. And in fact, when you're talking about the certainty in quote, the old days, you know, five, 10 years ago, it took 80% uh, of them closed, now 90% closing. So it's a much higher closing rate than we used to have. So let's look at why investors are attracted to SPACs. So Claudia, could you touch on um, why are they so hot right now? And what your thoughts are, uh, you know, are they good for investors, bad for investors? Uh, why all the buzz? Why, why the hot topic? I'll touch on the buzz part, as I think my PR team will will want me to focus on that aspect. Um, so we're very neutral as an exchange, obviously, and and uh, certainly I think safeguarding investors is a primary of importance, along working with you know the uh, regulators and all the other capital markets participants. But you know, you know, the United States in the last fifteen to twenty years, there has not been a tremendous amount of opportunity for companies to go public of a certain size. The reality is there were hundreds more IPOs a year compared to what we saw between, let's just say, 2010 and 2018. Now, SPACs were always a healthy single-digit component of the overall IPO market. Um, just in 2020 alone, though, it ballooned over 50%. Same for this year. At one point, you know, we'd listed in January alone on NASDAQ alone more SPACs and all of the month of January than we had in all of 2019. And 2019 prior to 2020 was a banner year. It was a good year. 2020 was just, you know, completely out of 
the, the league of previous years. But going back to my example about the United States market uh, capital market system, the opportunity to go public for certain growth companies was not always there. You have to be a certain size. You have to raise a certain amount of money. You had to have certain characteristics um, and metrics that you know the, the the investors wanted. What the SPAC opportunity has done is given the um, comfort level and the valuation, you now have another option of going public, one that um, is tried and tested, one that's worked for many and has uh, provided you know a stable um, you know next chapter for the during the life cycle of the of the privately held company. And given the quality of the investors involved and given some of the metrics involved and given the pipe investments, I would say that certainly has helped. Now the buzz around it has certainly been, you had your, you know, and part of, I think why so many SPACs happened last year's, this may seem a little silly, but everyone was sitting at home in front of their Zooms and you could just get more done, right? Like you, you didn't have to hop on a plane to do a road show and work with ropes and gray and work with other quality kind of participants like bankers to get this roadshow done and jump off of flights um, and do that. You could do it from the comfort of your home and be very efficient and get to anybody that you need to get to um, and getting these deals done. So I think that's certainly a contributing factor along with some of the other factors that I mentioned. But the buzz really, I think, started, I think, you know, DraftKings was a good story, obviously, in the returns it provided to its early stage investors. We had other quality names getting acquired. And at NASDAQ, you know, we treat SPACs just like we treat operating companies. It's the same rules and qualifications. We provide the same support and infrastructure to help that company grow when it comes to marketing or investor relations support. But really we've seen today the SPAC emerge as a viable option for any of these growth companies um, that would normally pick a traditional IPO. It's just, you know, what does the founder and the board feel is a better fit? And I think just the, uh, the, the, the nature of these quality names and high profile companies that have tremendous growth trajectory, uh, like a DraftKings, for example, um, these kind of quality names are certainly attracting uh, additional investors and certainly attracting additional attention um, you know, in the PR and the media space as well. So hopefully that, that's a good kind of entry point into, the, into answering your question. No, that's fantastic. And Mikhail, you've been investing in these for a long time, well before people knew what SPACs were in many cases. So can you tell people what, where are the different places to invest in SPACs? Because you know, there's some people that invest while it's still uh, you know, between the IPO and when they have found a company, when theoretically all you have is your $10 pile of treasuries. And then there's others obviously that come in in those different times along the way. So, so what are the different ways of going about it? How do you go about it? Um, what's been working for you? Yeah, so we, we actually done our first SPAC about six years ago and um, actually thank you NASDAQ. Um, but to your point earlier that it took a little, little longer before, you know, you spent like four months just educating people on what SPACs are back then. Now everyone sort of knows about them. So there's a lot more awareness. Um, but there's also a lot more viability because um, SPAC is a little bit different of a model for companies going public, right? Um, so the traditional IPO might not be the right fit for, for a lot of these companies. And SPACs, um, it, it's not better, it's just different for a number of reasons. And you know, we've discussed some of them and can talk more about some of the others. Um, one thing I would say is I think it aligns the investor a little bit better because if you look at, well, institutional investors that do the pipes. Um, and the reason why I say it is because if you look at how traditional IPOs are priced, typically you have investment bankers in there um, trying to sort of, um, you know, figure out the middle ground between the institutional demand and retail book and then the company, right? So there's a lot of work that's necessary on their end to figure out what's the right price. And, uh, you know, if I have a, uh, kind of mentioned that a lot of it is not, it's pretty opaque and you don't know what's going to happen until you actually price it and you go live. Um, you know, with the SPAC, that's not the case because you, you set a lot of the pricing mechanism way in advance of that. So if you have a good, uh, if you have a good sponsor that's aligned with a company, um, sort of the, when the bankers do the, their pricing, they're done and they're out, right? With uh, the pipe investor, whoever's leading it, you're going to be married to them for a couple of years. So you have a, a much stronger long-term incentive to, to get it right, right? But to come back to your, your previous question, so there's, there's two ways that sort of um, investors get into this stuff, right? You have the sponsor, and we've discussed that 
at length already a little bit. And then you have the retail investors that participate. Um, you know, you can go out there and uh, you know buy the unit right away at ten dollars. Uh, although a lot of them are, you know, when they uh, when they're priced, they come out. They usually trade a little bit above that. Although some have traded below at you know nine ninety five, nine ninety six. Um, but you know, those are small moves. So for the kind of question is, you know, why does it make sense investing in spy in pipes for the retail? And um, you know, the big reason for that is because I think of the zero interest rate policy. Um, which has effect on a number of asset classes, not just the SPACs. But if you look at the, how the SPACs work, right? You know, and you're looking at the unit deal. Um, so you have the money sitting in trust. You know that you're gonna get it back unless the United States of America defaults on its debt. So which is you know, completely other conversation and topic, but let's uh, put that aside for a second and pretend that United States uh, is never defaulting because we have the power to print as much money as, as we want. Um, so what happens is you have the built-in optionality of the warrant that's going to give you an additional return. So you know when you're looking at hedge funds and you're looking at any sophisticated, even slightly investor that looks at this stuff, and they want to get, let's say they have you know a certain percentage of their assets that they want to allocate to fixed income. Well, guess what? You know you're going to sit in a kind of investment grade bonds and get paid one percent. You know if you factor in the inflation, you're actually losing money, or you can park your money. In SPACs, you guess what? You also have leverage capability there because it's you know, treasury. So any prime broker is going to give you leverage on that yeah, or any broker really. Um, you can go on like reg T margin and stuff. So, you know, if and you look at the warrant upside, you factor that in, you're going to get the returns that are way, way higher um, than any fixed income product with pretty much the same downside. So if you look at it from that point of view and, you know, like risk the return, uh, profile, it becomes clear that it's uh, such a superior product to, you know, again, your fixed income allocation. So I think that's why we've seen that type of demand over the last couple of years, pick up in SPACs as the structure became more and more and more sort of, um, you know, widespread. So that's the early part when, when people are still backed up by that $10. Are you seeing right. people come in, um, are there new investors that tend to come in after the announcement is made and before the close? Yeah, or... well, that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's a whole different ballgame at that point because you have to evaluate um, what happens after the DSPAC, just like you would any other publicly traded company, you know, and that, and then it's, you know, what happened before kind of goes away and you're just back into like your regular vanilla plane landscape of uh, analyzing publicly traded stocks. So it's interesting that the first half trades like fixed income and the second half, it's just a normal. Exactly. Normal, uh, normal it market. has a like slightly binary um, aspect to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, Aclavia, what kind of trends are you seeing out there now? Are the dynamics shifting? Um, is the SEC playing a role? Is some of this changes in warrant accounting? Um, Kind of what what's going on in those markets? I, I know the the numbers have been expanding markedly, and then they slowed way down in February. Um, so what's going on here? Yeah, the SEC does play a, an active role, um, and and what I would say is, um, you know, their recent guidance has come through, and certainly would love Jane's perspective. But what they're now saying is that warrants need to be treated like liabilities. Um, so you, you certainly saw a drastic slowdown in the number of SPACs that are pricing um, as they have to go back to revitalizing their applications to confidential filings and, and, and figuring out the next step and how to treat those as liabilities or you know, go warrantless in some cases. And we have had a trickle of a few SPACs pricing that have gone warrantless. We had the first one that traded it like a liability last week and it priced and it's above. Um, you know, ten dollars at least trading uh, as of uh, earlier today. Um, there has not been a slowdown in in interest. Um, and I think it's just people going back to their audit firms and figuring out the best way to do that. So there has been some impact, and the SEC is taking an active role in in researching um, the SPAC phenomenon. Um, so we have seen an impact there, um, but from um, the perspective I've heard from capital markets participants is not slowed down the interest level of sponsors wanting to get new vehicles out. Um, but I'd love to hear, you know, certainly Jane is 
at the forefront, um, along with their colleagues at, at Ropes, and they're very active in the stock market. So I'll certainly defer some of that. Um, yeah, well. uh, Claudia, you're exactly right. And we were talking about this a little bit before the panel. Um, the huge dip in SPAC pricings was related to a an arcane accounting issue related to the warrants that I don't think investors actually care about. Um, but it did create um, a lot of work for the accountants and actually the lawyers got to rest a little bit. And uh, the accountants decided um, you either have to restate and account for that warrant as a liability, or there were uh, some attempts to try to amend warrant agreements to get equity treatment, but the SEC has not signed off on any of those that I know of yet. And so most people are going exactly as you say, Claudia, the, the liability accounting route, restating their financials, and there's just a, a ton of work to do. And there's only a handful of accounting firms that work with SPACs. So I think that's that's the bottleneck. Um, we're still seeing people um, wanting to do SPACs. We're certainly um, still talking from the company side, we're talking to a lot of uh, SPACs um, for, for de-SPAC processes. So I don't think the interest has gone down at all. So one of the, or two of the data points that I found were as of the end of March, there were over a hundred SPAC companies with uh, pending merger approvals and 500, no, sorry, 400 SPACs looking for target companies. And I just said, this has got to be such a boon to the late stage venture capital funds because now they have so many more buyers, especially if these companies, uh, one of you was saying, we're not perhaps ready for prime time. You've got 400 more buyers out there looking to essentially hoover up late stage venture companies, high growing companies and, and pull them onto the market. Does this create a little bit of a floor in pricing when you have that much on the demand side? Is, is this part of the trend that, that the, those pricing, the, the pricing in those sectors are not going to drop because it's the same way in, in private capital when you have a huge amount of dry powder, you're always going to have the demand side really pushing hard here. And, and is that something that we're seeing so you're not expecting any drop um, for those types of private companies and their valuations? And that, that's an, uh, that's for any one of you to take on, either Jane, the Clavia, even Michaela, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in first. We actually have a pretty extensive venture capital portfolio. I'm an entrepreneur by background. You know, I've been started a couple of companies and been involved in the scene ever since uh, Y Combinator launch in 2005. Um, we have a portfolio of about um, a little over 100 venture capital companies. So I see this hap happening all the time now where um, it's not, it's so, Back in the day, the SPACs were considered kind of like these like weird uh, you know, structures and the uh, traditional appeal was a lot sexier, obviously. Um, but with the awareness that came over the last couple of years, the, it almost kind of reversed. And you know, to your point that there's a backlog of like 400 plus SPACs, I think what happens is a lot of them um, have been replacing traditional IPOs with SPACs, so not in addition, right? So there's an overlap, that's one point. Second point, so if you look at uh, the dot-com bubble, you know, you, you go back about 20 years ago. The, um, comp so, and granted, there's been a lot of inflation since then, but if you look at the comparables, um, tech companies used to go public a lot, a lot earlier. And it's been actually a really big uh, pain point for a lot of institutional investors. Um, waiting until companies hit, you know, first it was billion, then five, then 10 billion, then, you know, Uber went public at 40 billion plus, uh, which a lot of investors have been upset about because at that point, um, you know, a lot of the juice has been squeezed out. So, you know, what, we can make an argument that SPACs have not only provided an alternative, um, you know, to go public, but also made the system a little bit more efficient uh, because of the things that I mentioned before, where, you know, you have alignment of interest between investors and so on and so forth. Um, which, you know, every time you introduce an efficiency into the system, it lowers the barriers to entry for a lot of other players. So from that perspective, you have, you know, venture capital, you know, basically late stage companies going public sooner. And, um, you know, I think it's actually a good thing for everyone. Interesting. So, um, Jane, let me come back to you for a second. So if we follow on with what Mikhail was, Mikhail was saying, that, you um, 
you know, a little bit faster, cheaper, better for the IPO markets. Are there any uh, downsides in so much that investor protections are lacking? Or do investor have, do the standard investor have the same protections that they used to have from a legal or practical standpoint that you can see? Well, it's all about disclosure, right? Um, one of the big points are, you know, conflicts of the sponsors because many sponsors can, you know, either go invest in the late stage company through a venture fund or they have a SPAC, um, but that's all disclosed. And that's, that's the game here is making sure that everything is out there and the investors do have the information they need so they can make the decision. Um, I guess I'm smiling because I know that um, of the panelists, I'm probably the only one who was practicing during the dot-com bubble when we took a lot of companies public that had you know, zero revenue at um, huge valuations and we know what happened um, in 2000. So just sort of a, a cautionary note, um, just on the other side of Mikhail's enthusiasm. And I would just add on the, um, on the disclosure front, um, as Jane mentioned, you know, S1s just like regular um, IPO S1s for SPACs contain, you know, pretty robust disclosures, but this is in, in particular, given the retail interest, um, has been something that the SEC is also focused on. So in December, they issued um, quite a bit of guidance, both on the, for the IPOs and for the I, IBC stage of certain conflicts of interest that, um, you know, SPAC should be sure to address. So for example, like the two-year time horizon that we we're talking about that might create um, an incentive to sort of push through a deal. Um, so there's been a real focus on disclosures, and I think um, S1s and just facts in general have sort of responded um, in turn both to, you know, the SEC guidance, to the markets, um, in terms of addressing any concerns um, that investors have. So they're actually like pretty nimble um, products that have evolved throughout this as well. So, um, so very quickly, I just want to say, um, we were afraid a Klavi would have to leave early because he had a conflict. So in a belt and suspenders move, we reached out and grabbed Annie Hancock, who I want to introduce because she is a BU law grad and works with Jane at Ropes and Gray. So if you are wondering about who this extra person was who's hopped in, it's Annie and we are thrilled to have her here because Annie spends her day doing SPACs all the time. So when we're down in the weeds, Annie is the one for us. Um, as I say, another, uh, another BU grant. So we're going to pivot um, to Q&A right now. But before we do, last quick, super quick question. Is your sense that if we roll forward another year, are, uh, are we going to have the level of SPACs that we have now? Um, yes, no, maybe. Just, just quick, quick answers. Do you think there'll be a change coming one way or the other? Is this the lightning round, Nina? This is, this is the finish up lightning round before we hit q and I'm gonna give the lawyers the answer. It depends. I don't think they're going away. Um, will, will this you know, buzz continue? It, it's, it's who knows? So that's the lawyer's answer. I'll let, I'll let the investors give real answers. I think, I think there's upside from what you're seeing right now, um, but I don't know that it's going to be like January of 2021. Right, right. It's kind of a healthy medium is what I'm thinking, but it's definitely not going away. The corporate carve up opportunity, the M&A opportunity for a sponsor backed, you know, public company sponsor. I think there's, there's still tremendous opportunity ahead of us. Excellent. Mikhail, last word for you. Yeah, I think, um, think it's going to be different. So the only constant is change. Um, it's definitely not going away. Um, I think if anything, you know, things are going to be a little bit more efficient. Um, no one has said anything about crypto or blockchain. So maybe they'll put SPACs on the blockchain and, you know, everything will be different down the line. I don't know, but it's, it's definitely going to continue evolving. Um, and the other thing I would mention is, um, you know, just like when humans get involved in any system, this is like an engineer speaking in me, um, things get a little bit excited and, you know, you see these gyrations in the 
in the capital markets where you have an overabundance of something, right? People get excited about it, they pile in there and then there's the retracement. So we're gonna see these cycles um, even you know, in the SPAC market like we're seeing right now. But I think that's, I think it's here to stay. Interesting. Well, thank you very much. We're going to turn it over for Q&A now. And um, Marianne, do you run Q&A or do I run Q&A? I think it might be easier for you to vet who asks what. Can you see the questions? I can see the questions up here. So um, some of these are really long questions. Uh, so hold on one second, let me see. So, so far we've only had two questions come in. Um, and do any of the panelists, this is from Michael Baralski, do any of the panelists care to comment on how the investment vehicles, um, and, and this is, let me back up. In the last year, opportunities to invest in SPACs via retail investment companies, mutual funds, ETFs, et cetera, has arisen. Do any of the panelists care to comment on how those investment vehicles may affect the dynamics of the SPAC marketplace? And the first SPAC focus ETF launched last fall. Written, oh, the prospectus was written by a BU alum. Oh my gosh, it could have been Jane or Annie. I don't know. Um, nope, they're, they're saying no. So would either of you like to tackle, would any of you like to tackle that? Come on, somebody has to tackle it. How do the investment vehicles, such as mutual funds or ETFs, affect the dynamics of the SPAC marketplace? Come on, guys, you can't all be quiet like good this. Question. Mikhail, I'm going to toss it to you. What it's do you good, think? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I'll tell you right now that I, I don't know specifically, but um, you know, that actually makes me think because a lot of times you know what happens in the ipo is you have a lot of these you know i think mutual funds participate you have pension funds you have you know big institutional investors participate in the ipo process and you know it goes to the kind of what i was talking about earlier where you have investment banks a lot of times protecting investors making sure that everything gets priced properly right um, pushing back on the company and so forth um, when you have a pipe happening that doesn't really happen to the same extent and what happens is a lot of times, you know, these investors are even absent from the process because you have like, it's a little bit of like a club deal almost, you know, when these things happen. So I don't know about ETFs and uh, mutual funds, but um, I would not be surprised if you look, when you look at the percentage of the participants, a lot of these uh, kind of, um, you know, investors that have been participating in IPOs are just don't, they don't exist in the kind of in the pipe um, landscape, so. Interesting. Okay, there's another question on um, uh, is there a bigger appetite for tech growth companies or for consistently established companies with predictable cash flows? Uh, Claudia, that might be up your alley. Yeah, I think I think you know, software and tech is really the name of the game, and I, it, what we've seen certainly is um, consumer companies turning themselves and morphing their business plans into more of that recurring revenue software type. So you look at Peloton, it's not an exercise company, it's a media play, and it's also a recurring revenue stream. So the, it, the elements of a software or a tech platform are certainly evident outside of those industries. Um, to the point of the question, there are specific SPACs that are focused on the software world or the tech world. They're gonna continue, they're gonna do well, we think. The EV car space was certainly a space that people got into. Um, you saw other areas, including the ESG world, decarbonization, um, energy 2.0 related SPACs that will, became very active. And that's a theme we're going to continue seeing. And they've done extremely well on NASDAQ, even though I think traditionally many of those companies um, thought to list elsewhere, but the decarbonization type companies that are solving kind of, um, you know, some of the energy needs and the issues around energy are, are going to continue doing well. So we have seen themes um, emerge. Um, specific SPACs are founded by sponsors that have done you know, um, and been very successful in their respective industries. So real, think of real estate um, investors becoming prop tech SPAC sponsors. So the next generation of that. So you're going to see continued interest in that world. Um, and so I think tech will continue, but any of the ancillary areas as well 
um, as well as any of the disruptive technology elements that are that are available out there um, that are thinking a little more long term. I think that those are good candidates for the SPAC. And I think adding to the energy piece is just in general ESG focused SPACs who are looking at you know sustainability. Um, there's at least one SPAC out there that's designed to invest in women-owned businesses. There are other SPACs out there that are um, you know, focused on uh, equity, diversity, and access. So um, a lot of those things are differentiators be between SPACs. Excellent. Uh, do you want to add in here, Mikhail, as well, or no? Yeah, I mean, I look, you know, the only thing I, I would say is um, I would, you know, caution a lot of people getting in, you know, investing into these things, especially after they despect, because, um, you know, there's a lot of hype going on. And, uh, you know, like before we've seen in like electric cars industry, right? And the, it, so what happens in the specs is like it uh, creates like slightly weird incentives for everyone, um, you know, especially as it, they get closer to like the despecking period. And, uh, you know, in general, talking about disclosures these days, you know, if you look at the prospectus they throw everything in the kitchen sink in there right but as an investor you got to look at the numbers you got to look at you know what you got to look at the actions of these companies not just the words um and then the other thing i would kind of point out you know talking about pre-revenue companies these days the only pre-revenue companies that can get away with billion dollar valuations are like biotechs right you have zero revenues and they're going out of three billion dollar plus valuations so you know unless you're a scientist that understands all this stuff um you know, it's 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 hard to really un figure out what what are these companies really worth. But when you look at the numbers, the math uh, sometimes is a lot easier to compute. So those are just my two cents. Excellent. So here's another question on how critical projections are to the sale, and can companies negotiate the deals with founders for more favorable terms? So. This is when you're a SPAC sponsor looking to buy a private company. How does that negotiation work? Yeah, so I can take I, that one. yeah I have to go first. Um, so basically, I mean, you go, nothing is set in stone, uh, right? Negotiations can happen at any time, but uh, typically, you know, at the beginning, uh, you know, I would say the, so the sales, obviously extremely important. And it's kind of similar to what happens in like the VC land, right? When you're looking at, or even later stage private equity stuff, when you're looking at the trajectory of the company, the sales growth curve is really, really important. Um, you know, so you also want to, as a sponsor, what you want to do with when you kind of working with a company, you also want to line up a number of news uh, events to sort of publicize after the SPAC. So you want to have um, that in your uh, kind of, uh, you know, you want to be armed with certain events that you want to disclose to the public after your the you know the merger whatever you know whatever it may be um to obviously you know showcase that your business is doing well um you know whether it's a new contract or you know you're entering a new geography so you want to be kind of armed with that so that's kind of one thing um but uh, you know the rest is just like anything else it's uh you know the growth in the in the sales uh improvement in the margins and uh making sure that the operation ru runs well so it's right. It's it's not rocket science unless unless it's uh, you know rocket science fact. <laughs> All right. So so the next one has to come. But but quickly though, there is a difference. If you're going through the regular way IPO, um, aren't projections more limited than if you're going through a spec? Yeah, you can't disclose projections in a regular way, S one, um, and they only get disclosed when you do the DSPAC transaction. When you're IPOing a SPAC, there's no projections. You're essentially taking a bank account public. Um, so there's there's nothing to project. But in the, any M&A process, obviously a target has to give forecasts to a buyer to get to their valuation. And um, those end up getting presented in an S4 exactly the same way when you do public company M&A, regular way companies, you also provide projections and um, the, the issue, the legal issue, and Annie knows this well, is that um, projections are now, we are now being told that the projections in an S4 do not get the protection of the safe harbor that Annie mentioned. And so there is a, a heightened concern about ex, you know, legal exposure 
with respect to those projections. And that's a lot of what's um, what we're watching down at the, the SEC. Annie, do you want to jump in on that? Because I know. Um, what Jane is, is referencing is um, a few weeks ago, the SEC issued a statement um, suggesting, not necessarily taking the position, but that, you know, SPAC, um, the projections released in the IBC context should sort of be treated um, like projections in the IPO context and that they don't have the safe harbor um, um, available, um, meaning that there's increased liability risk on it. Um, the SEC suggested, you know, they could um, take a few different steps in order to um, sort of make the IBC process and the projections sort of treated similarly to the IPO context where they're not allowed. And they could do that by, you know, amending the definition of what means of what a blank check company is, because right now SPACs technically fall outside of that definition. Um, similarly, you know, IPOs technically aren't defined under the PSLRA, so they could do that. Um, or Congress or, you know, could get involved and, and change some of the um, regulations. But I think as a practical matter, um, we don't actually think it really changes the litigation landscape all that much um, because you're going to get sued either way um, if something goes south, right? You only get sued when there's like a real stock drop. Um, so what you need that to happen um, and even, you know, putting aside the safe harbor, which is like, you know, a great defense, you also still have the bespeaks caution doctrine, which is sort of plays a similar role. Um, so as a practical matter, it probably doesn't have all that um, much impact on, you know, actual liability, but, you know, it's a nice to have, it's great, you know, it's nice to have, and it gives people a little more comfort. And um, if anything, it might uh, play into how underwriters are willing to participate in the IBC, but um, a lot of that remains to be seen, so. Excellent. So the next questions come from someone uh, wearing a startup hat. So if you're a startup, how do you reach out um, to do a SPAC merger? Do you call a lawyer, a banker, an advisor? So how, how do you find those people who are looking to find you? And secondly, can a startup shop between SPACs? So we talked about the demand side. There's so much demand from these SPACs. Um, and Jane, uh, you, you mentioned SPAC offs. So that there is a lot of demand. And Claudia, maybe you you can throw in on this question as well, or uh, Mikhail too. But let's start okay. with Jane. Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, we're involved in a lot of SPAC offs right now where we have um, clients who are really attractive targets and they are being courted not only by SPACs, but by you know, regular way buyers, private equity buyers. And you know, that demand um, is creating you know, a, a great environment to get full value um, for your company. Um, so absolutely. Uh, who do you call first? Who knows? Sometimes we get the first call. Sometimes the bankers get the first call. Um, it's sometimes there'll, there'll be someone on your board who knows somebody. Um, it's it's a whole ecosystem that you need to explore and get to know. Okay, so we have about one minute left here. So Mikhail and Claudia, if you can throw in with your points on this, and sure. then I um, so you know the, who the so I saw the other Q and A question was like who are these because um, they actually go hand in hand. Who are the sponsors, right? So you have for the most part they're hedge fund guys and venture capital companies. You have a couple of private equity guys in there um, and a bunch of banks. So it's once the banks caught on that these hedge fund guys are basically still stealing away their banking fees that started launching their own their own SPACs. Uh, but for startups, um, you have, you know, typically a startup will have board of directors and, you know, Jane said a number of advisors. So we actually have, I'm, you know, I'm on, um, let's say I'm an affiliate with, uh, with the startup that, um, you know, has kind of reached out to me about uh, potentially looking for SPACs, right? So, you know, go through your advisor network because at the end you want to reach, you know, someone that has a track record in the SPAC land. So either one of the hedge funds that has done a bunch of these or, you know, even the investment banks. Um, so they typically will take your call. Okay. And then the last word is yours, Eklavia. And then we're off to Marianne. No, I think, I think Jane and, and Mikhail covered it really well. I'd say part of it is also building a great company and a brand. A lot of the exit options come to you. 
it, there are enough kind of um, triggers out there that will result in people wanting to have that conversation. And while I think it's great to be proactive, I think staying focused and building that brand, impacting customers, impacting the community that you serve uh, will certainly speak volumes for itself and result in some, some exit options as well to, to add on to um, what my esteemed colleagues here had to say, which I think I- If they build it, do. they will come. Because that's right, that's right. Well, my goodness, I have to say thank you to all of you, of our panelists, what a tremendous amount of expertise and knowledge that you were able to share with our audience today. Clavia, Mikhail, Jane, Annie, and Nina, it was a great pleasure having Boston University showcase your understanding of SPACs today. I've certainly learned a lot. I'm sure our audience members really appreciated what you had to share today. I wanna thank our audience for taking the time to join us today. Our questions that were asked were fantastic. I also wanna take this time to thank the many donors out there who support the good work and the valuable programs at the university. You help make this institution a rich environment for students, faculty, alumni, and friends. And for that, we are truly grateful. We look forward to having you all join us again in the future. Please keep an eye on the BU Alumni calendar for upcoming events and check back often as programs are added on a regular basis. Really appreciate your time with us today. Thank you everyone, enjoy your evening and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.